Welcome back. Panel is with us from their remote locations, Eddie Glaude Jr., Princeton University, and author of the new book, James Baldwin's America, and its urgent lessons for our own. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Casey Hunt and Hugh Hewitt, host on the Salem Radio Network. Well, I want to begin with um, an answer that has made the rounds in the political world, and it was an answer the president gave to a simple question Sean Hannity asked him, which is, what's your agenda for a second term? Here it is, Hugh Hewitt. What are your top priority items for a second term? Well, one of the things that will be really great, you know, the word experience is still good. I always say talent is more important than experience. I've always said that. But the word experience is a very important word. It's in a very important meaning. I never did this before. I never slept over in Washington. I was in Washington, I think, 17 times. All of a sudden, I'm president of the United States. You know the story. I'm riding down Pennsylvania Avenue with our first lady, and I say, this is great. But I didn't know very many people in Washington. It wasn't my thing. I was from Manhattan, from New York. Now I know everybody. And I have great people in the administration. You make some mistakes, like, you know, an idiot like Bolton. All he wanted to do is drop bombs on everybody. Hugh Hewitt, was that Roger Mudd, Ted Kennedy, uh, Redux? No, that was a Clayton Kershaw windup. And I think the president did not throw the pitch which is we're going to get back to 3.5% unemployment in January. We're going to get to a 355-ship Navy. I've got two Supreme Court justices, uh, 53 appeals court judges, 143 district court judges. We're going to have the economic blue-collar boom back. I mean, you've got to deliver on the pitch. But no, I didn't think it was a yeah. Roger Mudd moment at all. Casey Hunt, we have started this week for the first time public on the record criticism of the president's political messaging john thune probably the most prominent uh is this the beginning of a crack at least in a rhetorical split between senate republicans and the white house well chuck we've asked ourselves that over and over and over again and it never has been but on the other hand the president previously was winning he had republican support behind him and the theory was that the republican base was going to get them going to get them across the finish line and, and therefore bring senate republicans along and this pandemic i think has really shattered that theory of the case as we have seen this president's numbers sink in a substantial way and i don't think you can disconnect that from the rhetoric that we're hearing from senate republicans as you pointed out this isn't a situation where the only Americans who are following politics are the ones who are the most invested, the most partisan. The coronavirus has affected and touched every single American household. The numbers of Americans who know someone who has died from coronavirus are terribly high, they're, and, and they're much higher among households of color who are also newly reengaged in the wake of George Floyd's death. And if you are someone who is relying on the president's coattails to get you across the finish line in November, this is a very, very difficult place to be. Now, I think the sense is going to be, especially for you know many voters who have been turned, tuned into this all the way along, that it is far too little too late for these Republicans to break with the president at this stage, Chuck. Mm -hmm. Right. Eddie, uh, why do you believe the, it's been the virus that has produced the first cracks in that floor of support? I mean, one of the things we've noticed is for the first time, instead of, you know, sitting at that 44, 45 mark stubbornly, right, no matter what happened, this is the first time you're starting to see, and it's slow, but you're starting to see cracks, and he went down a couple of floors. He's more mm -hmm. like in the 40, 41 age. Why the virus, how did the virus make this happen while none of those other stories did? Well, in some ways, Chuck, the virus isn't partisan. It doesn't care about politics, uh, to my mind. And what it has done, in some ways, it has created a kind of continuity, a kind of similarity across our differences. We're all vulnerable. Some are more vulnerable than others, but we're all vulnerable to this. We're all having to deal with the fact that some of us have lost loved ones and we can't send them home. We can't, we can't attend their funerals. We can't uh, celebrate their lives like we wanted to, or like we would ordinarily to do. Uh, so I think at the end of the day, uh, I think everyday ordinary people talking around the country want a response from the federal government to a pandemic that has disrupted everything in our lives. And I think the administration has failed. And it's failed not only Democrats, it's failed Republicans, independents, it's failed all of Americans. 
Hugh, how would you advise the president to turn this around? I mean, it, it does look like at this point they've made the decision the federal government isn't going to own the response. I mean, Secretary Azar kept bringing it back to the states, back to the states. I, I understand that's a, 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 a federalism response, but it's not working. Well, yesterday, 500 Americans died, Chuck. And in Germany, 680 Germans died. Uh, the United States' death toll has dropped dramatically from May when it was 2,700. And in between, it's been a month and three days since George Floyd was murdered. In between, we had millions of Americans express their anger at over... Uh, zealous policing and at the unnecessary use of violence, often lethal against African-Americans. And that was an event in the story of this virus. There's mm -hmm. another event in the story of the virus. There's a ventilator supply now of 50,000 that the president got done. There is a, a lot more social distancing and a lot of older Americans are intuitively staying away. And the sharp rise in right. cases is among younger Americans. So what I think the president has to do, I, look, Joe Biden is very confident. He's measuring the, dapes, uh, the drapes in the uh, White House basement already. He's going to, he thinks he's got this in the bag. President needs to, as I said in the first segment, go back to his numbers and say, hey, America, who's going to get us back to where we were in January? Joe Biden in the basement yeah. or Donald Trump? And I think he's got to do that in one-on-one -on -one interviews with as many people, including yeah. you and people who might be very tough on him in, in conversation every day, a one-on-one -on -one interview right. like he did in 2016. Okay. Casey, do Senate Republicans want the federal government to take more responsibility for this response? Yes. Yes, absolutely yes. I mean, this has been an unmitigated disaster for the perspective of many of them. And I'm sorry, but this picture that Hugh is painting of, you know, Americans looking at you know, the world the way it was in January and definitely deciding here in June that President Trump is the one to fix the problems that that frankly cascaded on his watch seems to me to be something certainly that when I talk to Senate Republicans behind closed doors, they don't yeah. buy. All right, I'm going to pause the conversation here, but I promise everybody's got another shot at this uh, uh, in a moment. When we come back, just how far behind the world is the United States in combating the coronavirus? That's next. Hello from Washington, I'm Chuck Todd, and thanks for checking out the Meet the Press channel on YouTube. Click on the button down here to subscribe and click over here to watch the latest interviews, highlights, and other digital exclusives.